This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Two. A Damp Symbolic Interlude. The night mist fell. From the moon it rolled clustered about the spires and towers, and then settled below them, so that the dreaming peaks were still in lofty aspiration toward the sky. Figures that dotted the day like ants now brushed along as shadowy ghosts, in and out of the foreground. The Gothic halls and cloisters were infinitely more mysterious as they loomed suddenly out of the darkness, outlined each by myriad faint squares of yellow light. Indefinitely from somewhere a bell boomed the quarter hour, and Amory, passing by the sundial, stretched himself out full length on the damp grass. The cool bathed his eyes and slowed the flight of time, time that had crept so insidiously through the lazy April afternoons, seemed so intangible in the long spring twilights. Evening after evening the senior singing had drifted over the campus in melancholy beauty, and through the shell of undergraduate consciousness had broken a deep and reverent devotion to the gray walls and gothic peaks, and all they symbolized as warehouses of dead ages. The tower, that in view of his window sprang upward, grew into a spire, yearning higher until its uppermost tip was half invisible against the morning skies, gave him the first sense of the transiency and unimportance of the campus figures except as holders of the apostolic succession. He liked knowing that gothic architecture, with its upward trend, was peculiarly appropriate to universities, and the idea became personal to him. The silent stretches of green, the quiet halls with an occasional late-burning scholastic light, held his imagination in a strong grasp, and the chastity of the spire became a symbol of this perception. "'Damn it all!' he whispered aloud, wetting his hands in the damp and running them through his hair. "'Next year I work!' Yet he knew that where now the spirit of spires and towers made him dreamily acquiescent, it would then overawe him. Where now he realized only his own inconsequence, effort would make him aware of his own impotency and insufficiency. The college dreamed on, awake. He felt a nervous excitement that might have been the very throb of its slow heart. It was a stream where he was to throw a stone whose faint ripple would be vanishing almost as it left his hand. As yet he had given nothing, he had taken nothing. A belated freshman, his oilskin slicker rasping loudly, slushed along the soft path. A voice from somewhere called the inevitable formula, Stick out your head, below an unseen window. A hundred little sounds of the current drifting on under the fog pressed in finally on his consciousness. Oh, God, he cried suddenly, and started at the sound of his voice in the stillness. The rain dripped on. A minute longer he lay without moving, his hands clenched. Then he sprang to his feet and gave his clothes a tentative pat. I'm very damn wet, he said aloud to the sundial. Historical The war began in the summer following his freshman year. Beyond a sporting interest in the German dash for Paris, the whole affair failed either to thrill or interest him. With the attitude he might have held toward an amusing melodrama, he hoped that it would be long and bloody. If it had not continued, he would have felt like an irate ticket-holder at a prize-fight where the principals refused to mix it up. That was his total reaction. Ha ha, Hortense. All right, ponies, shake it up. Hey, ponies, how about easing up on that crap game and shaking a mean hip? Hey, ponies. The coach fumed helplessly. The Triangle Club president, glowering with anxiety, varied between furious bursts of authority and fits of temperamental lassitude when he sat spiritless and wondered how the devil the show was ever going on tour by Christmas. All right, we'll take the pirate song. The ponies took last drags at their cigarettes and slumped into place. The leading lady rushed into the foreground, setting his hands and feet in an atmospheric mince, and as the coach clapped and stamped and tumped and da-da'd, 
they hashed out a dance. A great seething anthill was the Triangle Club. It gave a musical comedy every year, traveling with cast, chorus, orchestra, and scenery all through Christmas vacation. The play and music were the work of undergraduates, and the club itself was the most influential of institutions, over three hundred men competing for it every year. Amory, after an easy victory in the first sophomore Princetonian competition, stepped into a vacancy of the cast as Boiling Oil, a pirate lieutenant. Every night for the last week they had rehearsed Ha Ha Hortense in the casino, from two in the afternoon until eight in the morning, sustained by dark and powerful coffee, and sleeping in lectures through the interim. A rare scene, the casino. A big, barn-like auditorium, dotted with boys as girls, boys as pirates, boys as babies, the scenery in course of being violently set up, the spotlight man rehearsing by throwing weird shafts into angry eyes, over all the constant tuning of the orchestra or the cheerful tumpty tump of a triangle tune. The boy who writes the lyrics stands in the corner, biting a pencil, with twenty minutes to think of an encore. The business manager argues with the secretary as to how much money can be spent on those damn milkmaid costumes. The old graduate, president in ninety-eight, perches on a box and thinks how much simpler it was in his day. How a triangle show ever got off was a mystery, but it was a riotous mystery, anyway, whether or not one did enough service to wear a little gold triangle on his watch chain. Ha Ha Hortense was written over six times and had the names of nine collaborators on the program. All triangle shows started by being something different, not just a regular musical comedy. But when the several authors, the president, the coach, and the faculty committee finished with it, there remained just the old reliable triangle show with the old reliable jokes, and the star comedian who got expelled or sick or something just before the trip, and the dark-whiskered man in the pony ballet who absolutely won't shave twice a day doggone it. There was one brilliant place in Ha Ha Hortense. It is a Princeton tradition that whenever a Yale man, who is a member of the widely advertised Skull and Bones, hears the sacred name mentioned, he must leave the room. It is also a tradition that the members are invariably successful in later life, amassing fortunes or votes or coupons or whatever they choose to amass. Therefore, at each performance of Ha Ha Hortense, half a dozen seats were kept from sale and occupied by six of the worst-looking vagabonds that could be hired from the streets, further touched up by the triangle makeup man. At the moment in the show where Firebrand, the pirate chief, pointed at his black flag and said, I am a Yale graduate, note my skull and bones, at this very moment the six vagabonds were instructed to rise conspicuously and leave the theater with looks of deep melancholy and an injured dignity. It was claimed, though never proved, that on one occasion the hired Elis were swelled by one of the real thing. They played through vacation to the fashionable of eight cities. Amory liked Louisville and Memphis best. These knew how to meet strangers, furnished extraordinary punch, and flaunted an astonishing array of feminine beauty. Chicago he approved for a certain verve that transcended its loud accent. However, it was a Yale town, and as the Yale Glee Club was expected in a week, the Triangle received only divided homage. In Baltimore, Princeton was at home, and everyone fell in love. There was a proper consumption of strong waters all along the line. One man invariably went on the stage highly stimulated, claiming that his particular interpretation of the part required it. There were three private cars. However, no one slept except in the third car, which was called the animal car, and where were herded the spectacled wind-jammers of the orchestra. Everything was so hurried that there was no time to be bored, but when they arrived in Philadelphia, with vacation nearly over, there was rest in getting out of the heavy atmosphere of flowers and grease paint, and the ponies took off their corsets with abdominal pains and sighs of relief. When the disbanding came, Amory set out post-haste for Minneapolis, for Sally Weatherby's cousin, Isabella Borga, was coming to spend the winter in Minneapolis while her parents went abroad. He remembered Isabel only as a little girl, with whom he had played sometimes when he first went to Minneapolis. She had gone to Baltimore to live, but since then she had developed a past. Amory was in full stride, confident, nervous, and jubilant. Scurrying back to Minneapolis to see a girl he had known as a child 
seemed the interesting and romantic thing to do. So without compunction he wired his mother not to expect him, sat in the train, and thought about himself for thirty-six hours. Petting On the triangle trip Amory had come into constant contact with that great current American phenomenon, the petting party. None of the Victorian mothers, and most of the mothers were Victorian, had any idea how casually their daughters were accustomed to be kissed. "'Servant girls are that way,' says Mrs. Houston Carmelite to her popular daughter. "'They are kissed first and proposed to afterward.' But the popular daughter becomes engaged every six months, between sixteen and twenty-two, when she arranges a match with young Hamble, of Campbell and Hamble, who fatuously considers himself her first love, and between engagements, the P.D., she is selected by the cut-in system at dances, which favors the survival of the fittest, as other sentimental last kisses in the moonlight, or the firelight, or the outer darkness. Amory saw girls doing things that even in his memory would have been impossible, eating three o'clock after dance suppers in impossible cafes, talking of every side of life with an air half of earnestness, half of mockery, yet with a furtive excitement that Amory considered stood for a real moral letdown. But he never realized how widespread it was until he saw the cities between New York and Chicago as one vast juvenile intrigue. Afternoon at the plaza, with winter twilight hovering outside and faint drums downstairs. They strut and fret in the lobby, taking another cocktail, scrupulously attired and waiting. Then the swinging doors revolve and three bundles of fur mince in. The theater comes afterward, then a table at the midnight frolic. Of course mother will be along there, but she will serve only to make things more secretive and brilliant, as she sits in solitary state at the deserted table, and thinks such entertainments as this are not half so bad as they are painted, only rather wearying. But the P.D. is in love again. It was odd, wasn't it, that though there was so much room left in the taxi, the P.D. and the boy from Williams were somehow crowded out and had to go in a separate car. Odd! Didn't you notice how flushed the P.D. was when she arrived just seven minutes late? But the P.D. gets away with it. The bell had become the flirt. The flirt had become the baby vamp. The bell had five or six callers every afternoon. If the P.D. by some strange accident has two, it is made pretty uncomfortable for the one who hasn't a date with her. The bell was surrounded by a dozen men in the intermissions between dances. Try to find the P.D. between dances. Just try to find her. The same girl, deep in an atmosphere of jungle music and the questioning of moral codes, Amory found it rather fascinating to feel that any popular girl he met before eight he might possibly kiss before twelve. "'Why on earth are we here?' he asked the girl with the green combs one night as they sat in someone's limousine outside the country club in Louisville. "'I don't know. I'm just full of the devil.' "'Let's be frank. We'll never see each other again. I wanted to come out here with you because I thought you were the best-looking girl in sight. You really don't care whether you ever see me again, do you?' No, but is this your line for every girl? What have I done to deserve it? And you didn't feel tired dancing, or want a cigarette, or any of the things you said. You just wanted to be— Oh, let's go in, she interrupted, if you want to analyze. Let's not talk about it. When the hand-knit, sleeveless jerseys were stylish, Amory, in a burst of inspiration, named them petting shirts. The name traveled from coast to coast on the lips of parlor snakes and P.D.'s. Descriptive. Amory was now eighteen years old, just under six feet tall, and exceptionally, but not conventionally, handsome. He had rather a young face, the ingeniousness of which was marred by the penetrating green eyes, fringed with long dark eyelashes. He lacked somehow that intense animal magnetism that so often accompanies beauty in men or women. His personality seemed rather a mental thing and it was not in his power to turn it on and off like a water faucet. But people never forgot his face. Isabel She paused at the top of the staircase. The sensations attributed to divers on springboards, leading ladies on opening nights, and lumpy, husky young men on the day of the big game crowded through her. 
she should have descended to a burst of drums or a discordant blend of themes from Thais and Carmen. She had never been so curious about her appearance. She had never been so satisfied with it. She had been sixteen years old for six months. "'Isabel!' called her cousin Sally from the doorway of the dressing-room. "'I'm ready!' She caught a slight lump of nervousness in her throat. "'I had to send back to the house for another pair of slippers. It'll be just a minute.' Isabel started toward the dressing-room for a last peek in the mirror, but something decided her to stand there and gaze down the broad stairs of the Minnehaha Club. They curved tantalizingly, and she could catch just a glimpse of two pairs of masculine feet in the hall below. Pump-shod in uniform black, they gave no hint of identity, but she wondered eagerly if one pair were attached to Amory Blaine. This young man, not as yet encountered, had nevertheless taken up a considerable part of her day, the first day of her arrival. Coming up in the machine from the station, Sally had volunteered, amid a rain of question, comment, revelation, and exaggeration, "'You remember Amory Blaine, of course. Well, he's simply mad to see you again. He stayed over a day from college, and he's coming tonight. He's heard so much about you, says he remembers your eyes.' This had pleased Isabel. It put them on equal terms, although she was quite capable of staging her own romances with or without advance advertising. But following her happy tremble of anticipation came a sinking sensation that made her ask, "'How do you mean he's heard about me? What sort of things?' Sally smiled. She felt rather in the capacity of a showman with her more exotic cousin. "'He knows you're, you're considered beautiful and all that,' she paused, "'and I guess he knows you've been kissed.' At this, Isabel's little fist had clinched suddenly under the fur robe. She was accustomed to be thus followed by her desperate past, and it never failed to rouse in her the same feeling of resentment. Yet, in a strange town, it was an advantageous reputation. She was a speed, was she? Well, let them find out. Out of the window, Isabel watched the snow glide by in the frosty morning. It was ever so much colder here than in Baltimore. She had not remembered. The glass of the side door was iced. The windows were shirred with snow in the corners. Her mind played still with one subject. Did he dress like that boy there, who walked calmly down a bustling business street in moccasins and winter carnival costume? How very Western! Of course he wasn't that way. He went to Princeton, was a sophomore or something. Really, she had no distinct idea of him. An ancient snapshot she had preserved in an old Kodak book had impressed her by the big eyes, which he had probably grown up to by now. However, in the last month, when her winter visit to Sally had been decided on, he had assumed the proportions of a worthy adversary. Children, most astute of matchmakers, plot their campaigns quickly. And Sally had played a clever correspondence sonata to Isabel's excitable temperament. Isabel had been for some time capable of very strong, if very transient emotions. They drew up at a spreading white stone building, set back from the snowy street. Mrs. Weatherby greeted her warmly, and her various younger cousins were produced from the corners where they skulked politely. Isabel met them tactfully. At her best, she allied all with whom she came in contact, except older girls and some women. All the impressions she made were conscious. The half-dozen girls she renewed acquaintance with that morning were all rather impressed, and as much by her direct personality as by her reputation. Amory Blaine was an open subject. Evidently a bit light of love, neither popular nor unpopular, every girl there seemed to have had an affair with him at some time or other, but no one volunteered any really useful information. He was going to fall for her. Sally had published that information to her young set, and they were retailing it back to Sally as fast as they set eyes on Isabel. Isabel resolved secretly that she would, if necessary, force herself to like him. She owed it to Sally. Suppose she were terribly disappointed. Sally had painted him in such glowing colors. He was good-looking, sort of distinguished when he wants to be, had a line, and was properly inconstant. In fact, he summed up all the romance that her age and environment led her to desire. She wondered if those were his dancing shoes that Fox trotted tentatively around the soft rug below. All impressions, and, in fact, all ideas, were extremely kaleidoscopic to Isabel. 
She had that curious mixture of the social and the artistic temperaments found often in two classes, society women and actresses. Her education, or rather her sophistication, had been absorbed from the boys who had dangled on her favor. Her tact was instinctive, and her capacity for love affairs was limited only by the number of the susceptible within telephone distance. Flirt smiled from her large black-brown eyes and shone through her intense physical magnetism. So she waited at the head of the stairs that evening while slippers were fetched. Just as she was growing impatient, Sally came out of the dressing room, beaming with her accustomed good nature and high spirits, and together they descended to the floor below, while the shifting searchlight of Isabel's mind flashed on two ideas. She was glad she had high color tonight, and she wondered if he danced well. Downstairs, in the club's great room, she was surrounded for a moment by the girls she had met in the afternoon. Then she heard Sally's voice repeating a cycle of names, and found herself bowing to a sextet of black and white, terribly stiff, vaguely familiar figures. The name Blaine figured somewhere, but at first she could not place him. A very confused, very juvenile moment of awkward backings and bumpings followed, and everyone found himself talking to the person he least desired to. Isabel maneuvered herself and Froggy Parker, freshman at Harvard, with whom she had once played hopscotch, to a seat on the stairs. A humorous reference to the past was all she needed. The things Isabel could do socially with one idea were remarkable. First, she repeated it rapturously in an enthusiastic contralto with a sousson of southern accent. Then she held it off at a distance and smiled at it, her wonderful smile. Then she delivered it in variations and played a sort of mental catch with it, all this in the nominal form of dialogue. Froggy was fascinated and quite unconscious that this was being done not for him, but for the green eyes that glistened under the shining, carefully watered hair a little to her left, for Isabel had discovered Amory. As an actress even in the fullest flush of her own conscious magnetism gets a deep impression of most of the people in the front row, so Isabel sized up her antagonist. First he had auburn hair, and from her feeling of disappointment she knew that she had expected him to be dark and of garter advertisement slenderness. For the rest, a faint flush and a straight romantic profile, the effect set off by a close-fitting dress suit and a silk ruffled shirt of the kind that women still delight to see men wear, but men were just beginning to get tired of. During this inspection Amory was quietly watching. "'Don't you think so?' she said suddenly, turning to him, innocent-eyed. There was a stir, and Sally led the way over to their table. Amory struggled to Isabel's side and whispered, "'You're my dinner partner, you know. We're all coached for each other.' Isabel gasped. This was rather right in line. But really she felt as if a good speech had been taken from the star and given to a minor character. She mustn't lose the leadership a bit. The dinner-table glittered with laughter at the confusion of getting places, and then curious eyes were turned on her, sitting near the head. She was enjoying this immensely, and Froggy Parker was so engrossed with the added sparkle of her rising color that he forgot to pull out Sally's chair, and fell into a dim confusion. Amory was on the other side, full of confidence and vanity, gazing at her in open admiration. He began directly, and so did Froggy. I've heard a lot about you since you wore braids. Wasn't it funny this afternoon? Both stopped. Isabel turned to Amory shyly. Her face was always enough answer for anyone, but she decided to speak. How? From whom? From everybody. For all the years since you've been away. She blushed appropriately. On her right, Froggy was hors de combat already, although he hadn't quite realized it. I'll tell you what I remembered about you all these years, Amory continued. She leaned slightly toward him and looked modestly at the celery before her. Froggy sighed. He knew Amory and the situations that Amory seemed born to handle. He turned to Sally and asked her if she was going away to school next year. Amory opened with grapeshot. I've got an adjective that just fits you. This was one of his favorite starts. He seldom had a word in mind, but it was a curiosity provoker, and he could always produce something complimentary if he got in a tight corner. Oh, what? Isabel's face was a study in enraptured curiosity. Amory shook his head. I don't know you very well yet. Will you tell me afterward? She half whispered. He nodded. We'll sit out. Isabel nodded. 
"'Did anyone ever tell you you have keen eyes?' she said. Amory attempted to make them look even keener. He fancied, but he was not sure, that her foot had just touched his under the table. But it might possibly have only been the table leg. It was so hard to tell. Still, it thrilled him. He wondered quickly if there would be any difficulty in securing the little den upstairs. Babes in the Woods Isabel and Amory were distinctly not innocent, nor were they particularly brazen. Moreover, amateur standing had very little value in the game they were playing, a game that would presumably be her principal study for years to come. She had begun, as he had, with good looks and an excitable temperament, and the rest was the result of accessible popular novels and dressing-room conversation culled from a slightly older set. Isabel had walked with an artificial gait at nine and a half, and when her eyes, wide and starey, proclaimed the ingenue most. Amory was proportionately less deceived. He waited for the mask to drop off, but at the same time he did not question her right to wear it. She, on her part, was not impressed by his studied air of blasé sophistication. She had lived in a larger city and had slightly an advantage in range, but she accepted his pose. It was one of the dozen little conventions of this kind of affair. He was aware that he was getting this particular favor now because she had been coached. He knew that he stood for merely the best game in sight, and that he would have to improve his opportunity before he lost his advantage. So they proceeded with an infinite guile that would have horrified her parents. After the dinner, the dance began, smoothly. Smoothly? Boys cut in on Isabel every few feet, and then squabbled in the corners with, You might have let me get more than an inch, and She didn't like it either. She told me so next time I cut in. It was true. She told everyone so and gave every hand a parting pressure that said, You know your dances are making my evening. But time passed, two hours of it, and the less subtle beau had better learned to focus their pseudo-passionate glances elsewhere, for eleven o'clock found Isabel and Amory sitting on the couch in the little den off the reading-room upstairs. She was conscious that they were a handsome pair, and seemed to belong distinctively in this seclusion, while lesser lights fluttered and chattered downstairs. Boys who passed the door looked in enviously. Girls who passed only laughed and frowned, and grew wise within themselves. They had now reached a very definite stage. They had traded accounts of their progress since they had met last, and she had listened to much she had heard before. He was a sophomore, was on the Princetonian board, hoped to be chairman in senior year. He learned that some of the boys she went with in Baltimore were terrible speeds, and came to dances in states of artificial stimulation. Most of them were twenty or so, and drove alluring red stutzes. A good half seemed to have already flunked out of various schools and colleges, but some of them bore athletic names and made him look at her admiringly. As a matter of fact, Isabel's closer acquaintance with the universities was just commencing. She had bowing acquaintance with a lot of young men who thought she was a pretty kid worth keeping an eye on. But Isabel strung the names into a fabrication of gaiety that would have dazzled a Viennese nobleman such is the power of young contralto voices on sink-down sofas. He asked her if she thought he was conceited. She said there was a difference between conceit and self-confidence. She adored self-confidence in men. "'Is Froggy a good friend of yours?' she asked. "'Rather. Why? He's a bum dancer.' Amory laughed. "'He dances as if the girl were on his back instead of in his arms.' She appreciated this. "'You're awfully good at sizing people up. Amory denied this painfully. However, he sized up several people for her. Then they talked about hands. "'You've got awfully nice hands,' she said. "'They look as if you played the piano, do you?' I have said that they had reached a very definite stage, nay, more a very critical stage. Amory had stayed over a day to see her, and his train left at 12.18 that night. His trunk and suitcase awaited him at the station. His watch was beginning to hang heavy in his pocket. Isabel, he said suddenly, I want to tell you something. They had been talking lightly about that funny look in her eyes, and Isabel knew from the change in his manner what was coming. Indeed, she had been wondering how soon it would come. Amory reached above their heads and turned out the electric light, so that they were in the dark, except for the red glow that fell through the door from the reading-room lamps. Then he began. I don't know whether or not you know what you—what I'm going to say— 
Lordy, Isabel, this sounds like a line, but it isn't. I know, said Isabel softly. Maybe we'll never meet again like this. I have darned hard luck sometimes. He was leaning away from her on the other arm of the lounge, but she could see his eyes plainly in the dark. You'll meet me again, silly. There was just the slightest emphasis on the last word, so that it became almost a term of endearment. He continued a bit huskily. I have fallen for a lot of people, girls, and I guess you have too, boys, I mean. But honestly, you— He broke off suddenly and leaned forward, chin on his hands. Oh, what's the use? You'll go your way, and I suppose I'll go mine. Silence for a moment. Isabel was quite stirred. She wound her handkerchief into a tight ball, and by the faint light that streamed over her, dropped it deliberately on the floor. Their hands touched for an instant, but neither spoke. Silences were becoming more frequent and more delicious. Outside, another stray couple had come up and were experimenting on the piano in the next room. After the usual preliminary of chopsticks, one of them started Babes in the Woods, and a light tenor carried the words into the den. Give me your hand, I'll understand, we're off to slumberland. Isabel hummed it softly, and trembled as she felt Amory's hand close over hers. Isabel, he whispered, you know I'm mad about you. You do give a darn about me. Yes. How much do you care? Do you like anyone better? No. He could scarcely hear her, although he bent so near that he felt her breath against his cheek. Isabel, I'm going back to college for six long months, and why shouldn't we— if I could only just have one thing to remember you by— Close the door. Her voice had just stirred so that he half wondered whether she had spoken at all. As he swung the door softly shut, the music seemed quivering just outside. Moonlight is bright. Kiss me good night. What a wonderful song, she thought. Everything was wonderful tonight. Most of all, this romantic scene in the den, with their hands clinging, and the inevitable looming charmingly close. The future vista of her life seemed an unending succession of scenes like this under moonlight and pale starlight, and in the backs of warm limousines, and in low, cozy roadsters stopped under sheltering trees. Only the boy might change, and this one was so nice. He took her hand softly. With a sudden movement he turned it, and holding it to his lips, kissed the palm. Isabel. His whisper blended in the music, and they seemed to float nearer together. Her breath came faster. Can't I kiss you, Isabel? Isabel? Lips half parted, she turned her head to him in the dark. Suddenly the ring of voices, the sound of running footsteps, surged towards them. Quick as a flash, Amory reached up and turned on the light, and when the door opened and three boys, the wrathy and dance-craving Froggy among them, rushed in, he was turning over the magazines on the table, while she sat without moving, serene and unembarrassed, and even greeted them with a welcoming smile but her heart was beating wildly, and she felt somehow as if she had been deprived. It was evidently over. There was a clamor for a dance, there was a glance that passed between them, on his side despair, on hers regret, and then the evening went on, with the reassured bow and the eternal cutting in. At quarter to twelve Amory shook hands with her gravely, in the midst of a small crowd assembled to wish him good speed. For an instant he lost his poise, and she felt a bit rattled when a satirical voice from a concealed wit cried, "'Take her outside, Amory!' As he took her hand, he pressed it a little, and she returned the pressure as she had done to twenty hands that evening. That was all. At two o'clock, back at the Weatherby's, Sally asked her if she and Amory had had a time in the den. Isabel turned to her quietly. In her eyes was the light of the idealist, the inviolate dreamer of Joan-like dreams. No she answered. I don't do that sort of thing any more. He asked me to, but I said no. As she crept in bed, she wondered what he'd say in his special delivery tomorrow. He had such a good-looking mouth. Would she ever? Fourteen angels were watching o'er them, sang Sally sleepily from the next room. Damn, muttered Isabel, punching the pillow into a luxurious lump and exploring the cold sheets cautiously. Damn! End of Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 2